There's an amazing science fiction convention in Atlanta that I used to go to every year called Dragon Con. I've been in a while. Life's busy. Coronavirus, you know. But whenever I do go, I'm always put on a panel with Les Johnson, who is a propulsion engineer from NASA. And we have a great time talking about whatever topic the convention organizers want us to chat about. And Les has a new book out and has a new mission that's going to be launching with Artemis in a couple of days. And I wanted to get a chance to interview him. It's about solar sails. And like the first really practical mission that's using a solar sail as a propulsion method. So we get into that. We talk about the role that science fiction plays as an inspiration for astronomers and engineers, everyone working in the space industry and journalists like me and probably you. So it's a fascinating conversation. Les is wonderful and I hope you enjoy. Les, it's good to see you again. It's funny. They always drag the two of us out at Dragon Con to be on the panels about space and astronomy. And uh, it's been a couple of years. It has been a few years. That darn COVID got in the way, right? And this year I was occupied with work, so I wasn't able to get over to Atlanta. Yeah, I'm not ready to go back to a convention with tens of thousands of people, some who may or may not have COVID, even though I've got all my, my vaccines, maybe one more, maybe two more vaccines, and I'll, I'll feel safe to, to rejoin enormous conferences. You know, maybe I'm a little, you know, overly... Uh, nervous about it, but but we'll see. I've had to ease my way into it. I've been to a few small meetings. That would have been the biggest, but I wasn't able to make it over to Atlanta this year. But yeah, I, I share yeah. your concern. It's really strange after being uh, in hibernation, uh, working at home. Uh, darn the luck for me, my first day back physically in the office after two years of working at home without catching COVID, the first day I was back in the office, two days later, I got COVID, and I was one of three people in the meeting from that first Monday that ended up getting sick. But I got through it pretty well. Oh, good, uh, good. It, it made me pretty sick, but I'm, it's all behind me now. So Yeah. Now, you are interesting because you sort of work in two fields. Like, on the one hand, you are at NASA developing the technology to carry us to the planets and to the stars. And on the other hand, you are deeply influenced and interested in science fiction. You're a science fiction writer and and have those those ideas. How much does your interest in science fiction drive your work at NASA? Well, the first thing I have to do is give my typical caveat. My science fiction writing and my book writing is totally on my own time. Right. Uh, when I do interviews like this or go to Dragon Con, I have to take vacation because NASA doesn't endorse my work. So I have to get that out there for everybody to understand that. But at the same time, it's really hard not to, to – well, it's really hard to untwine how they're all connected because, quite frankly, I decided to go into physics and work for NASA for two reasons. One of those was I was seven years old when Neil Armstrong walked on the moon. And I remember having my parents wake me up to see that. And then I started watching reruns of Star Trek with my sister. Yeah. <laughs> so after that, I was hooked. And I started reading Heinlein, Asimov, all the writers. And uh, it, that influenced my career. And now that I'm working at NASA, I uh, started writing. And it, it really, they influence both, yeah. I have to admit. I, I, I'm really thrilled to be working on some of the projects I'm working on because I read about them in science fiction. And at the same time, sometimes at work, uh, we'll be doing something and I'll have an inspiration that actually leads to something in a story or a novel. So they, they do work together. My, my experience is is actually almost exactly the same as yours, apart from the working at NASA part. But I was a... I was woken up by my dad to watch the space shuttle launch in 1981. And so I was just a kid. I was, I was 10 at the time and, and he was a product of the Apollo generation. And, and so it was this really meaningful event for him to see the first landing on the moon. And then he wanted me to experience that same thing with the space shuttle. And then I watched Star Trek reruns on our old black and white television and then my dad had a big collection of of Heinlein and Larry Niven, and I just worked my way through his science fiction books. And for me, it led into my career as a as a space journalist. But I could just as easily have ended up as an engineer or an astronomer or someone at, at NASA as well. There was an interesting paper that came out. Someone had studied how much influence science fiction has on 
on the career choices of, of astronomers and, and space scientists. And it's gigantic, like 70% or something directly in have claimed that their, their, their interest in space and astronomy comes from science fiction. It's huge. Well, I have a, a story that, that kind of corroborates that. A few years ago, uh, NASA wanted to understand uh, people who innovate. And each of the NASA field centers were asked to send two people to participate in like a eight week program, which culminated in a meeting at NASA headquarters where they're trying to understand the innovators. So they hired this psychology firm and I had to answer all these questions, you know, like, I, I don't know, it, it was, you know, kind of your whole background kind of thing. And they interviewed you. Then they brought us to Washington, put us in a conference room for a day, and we had to solve some problem. But then over lunch, uh, they had a speaker come in to assess the results of their interviews, and they put up this big cloud chart. And, and a cloud chart, for those that may not know what that is, in this case, is where they, they have words on the chart, and the font size of the words reflects how often people mention the word in the interviews, because the interviews were all recorded. And so they were asking what inspired people to go into science and engineering and go to work for NASA as innovators within the agency. And words popped up like Apollo, shuttle, exploration, science, discovery, innovation. But there was this enormous <laughs> block in the middle of the cloud chart that was empty, right? And they said, well, there were two words mentioned more often than anything else by far, a majority, not just a plurality. And these two words of what inspired multi-generations of NASA employees, not just my generation, but younger generations as well, two words, star trek right there in the middle <laughs> and, and, it, and that was an inspiration for almost everyone that's amazing yeah so what is your work for nasa what do you do within nasa well i am uh, an expert in, in advanced in space propulsion and lately i've been focusing on solar sails um, I have to be careful when I say that with my Southern accent here, S-A-I-L, <laughs> uh, not cell, C-E-L-L or otherwise. But that's a way of moving spacecraft through space without any propellant, but reflecting light from it. And in fact, uh, NASA's Artemis I mission, which is hopefully going to launch soon, has a small spacecraft on board called the Near-Earth Asteroid Scout, for which I serve as the uh, solar sail principal investigator. And we'll be using a 1,000 square foot solar sail as a propulsion system to take a small spacecraft to an asteroid. So once we launch, we have about a two-year mission, uh, not a five-year mission, but a two-year mission uh, to get to the asteroid. And that, that's kind of what I do in my day job. So how big is the solar sail that you're, you're going to be launching from Artemis? It's 925 square feet, so I round it up to about 1,000. And for those of you who can't picture that, uh, it's, a, it's a mid-size apartment. Um, it's also the equivalent of, a, of an American school bus, big yellow school bus by a school bus, right? That, right. That's about a thousand square feet. And and the like, what kind of a propulsion effect are you expecting once it actually launches? Well, what's what's way cool about a solar sail is it doesn't use fuel. And and just to give an example, you, p folks watching this this video cast, or if you're listening to it as a podcast, you can imagine there, there's light from my camera light here shining on me. And as that light reflects from me, there are little photons, little particles of light that comprise the, all of that. And each of those photons, although they have no rest mass, they do have momentum. And just like playing a game of billiards where you hit one ball with another and its momentum is transferred to make the ball that's hit to recoil, uh, anything that light reflects on is being pushed by that light. Now, on the Earth, where gravity is so strong and we've got air currents flowing, it's a very, very, very small force. Uh, you go out on a, a sunny, cloudless day at noon when the sun's directly overhead. And if you were to take the force of sunlight on two soccer fields, total area, it would be about the same as the force you'd feel in your hand if you put a quarter right. uh, on your hand. So but the nice thing is it's theory, constant. The sun's always shining. So that force is constantly accelerating your sail. So you can get up to pretty high speed. So in theory, you a solar sailing boat would work here on, on Earth. It's just that the effect from every other force that's acting on it is vastly greater than the sunlight. Absolutely. Orders of magnitude greater. That's right. You really need to get out in space away from that, have a lightweight reflector, uh, because the force of sunlight at any distance from the sun is constant because the sunlight intensity doesn't really vary a whole lot. And in order to have this work, it won't work on all spacecraft sizes. So when you see science fiction movies like in Star Trek or Wars or whatever, and they have a human spacecraft that unfurls a sail, 
uh, that's not realistic. You know, a sail to move a human class spacecraft would have to not be thousands of square feet. It would have to be hundreds of square miles, probably. Right. I mean, it would just be enormous. So it's a propulsion system that works for small spacecraft. But as long as the sun is shining and you have your sail and you can change the angle at which the light reflects from the sail, which changes the direction the force pushes you, you can navigate just about anywhere in near Earth space with a small spacecraft with that and, and do better performance overall than just about any other propulsion system which would run out of fuel pretty quickly. Right. Now, now I think when people imagine a solar sail, they're imagining something that is flying away from the sun, that the sun is pushing on the solar sail and it's flying directly perpendicular from, from the sun. But that's not true. It's all still about orbits, right? That's right. Uh, don't, don't forget the Earth's orbiting the sun. So whatever we launch from the Earth has a little bit of that, or has the same orbital energy, so it's circling the sun. And in order to move away from the sun, since you're circling it, you don't just stop in space and start moving away. You're, you're, you're going around. And in order to move away, you, you turn the sail so the light uh, has a net force on the sail that's accelerating you in the direction you're already going. Sort of like pushing the gas pedal on a car already moving, right? So you go to a higher speed. But when you do that, the orbit starts spiraling out from the sun. So you're getting more energy and you're moving away from the sun's gravity. But sunlight starts decreasing in intensity as you move away. So the further out you go, the less sunlight you have. So the force starts diminishing pretty rapidly. If you turn the sail around so that the force acting on it from the sun is a direction opposite to what you're moving, it's like putting on the brakes. And when you do that, the sun's gravity starts pulling you in. And as it pulls you in, the sunlight intensity goes up pretty rapidly hmm. and you actually start decelerating faster. <laughs> so a solar sail is actually more efficient at falling toward the sun than moving away from That's it. That's really amazing. Which is, which is counterintuitive and it's all because of this orbital mechanics thing, the fact that everything's moving. Yeah. And so a solar sail is actually the perfect vehicle to explore venus or mercury or get as close as possible to the sun the closer you get the closer you the faster you get closer that's right with a small spacecraft i have to give that caveat uh the, the near earth asteroid scout spacecraft only weighs a few tens of pounds um you know if you right. start talking about a spacecraft that's 100 pounds or a thousand pounds and the sail size gets really big it's still doable but it's it's a lot more challenging but, but as you like you to use that sailing analogy as you get closer and closer to the sun it's kind of like a storm hitting the sails on your sailboat and you could trim the sails as you get closer and closer to provide you know you have less surface area and now you're you're not accelerating into the sun but well actually you're you're getting to what got me interested in solar sails uh, aside from reading about them in a great book by Larry Niven and Jerry Pornell when I was in high school called The Moat in God's yes, Eye one of my favorite um, books you know aliens are invading the earth and they're coming on on these big sails propelled by laser beams to give them more thrust than you can get with sunlight so it was it was way cool um I, what I uh, started doing solar sailing work, it was really because I was interested in going to the stars. Um, uh, a, a big solar sail, like square kilometers in size, which we don't know how to build today, but is theoretically possible. Uh, you could fly in toward the sun, deploy it very, very close to the sun, get a lot of light pressure. My arms are going off screen. A lot of light pressure on that big <laughs> sail and give yourself quite a kick out of the solar system so that you might be able to reach another star in a few hundred years, as opposed to a chemical rocket, which is going to take tens of thousands of years. And there is a trajectory that takes you really close to the sun that actually gives you your maximum acceleration. The, there is. The there are various ways to do yeah. that. And that, and that, yeah. and that the, the light sail is the perfect machine for being able to, to do that. I love it. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. It's the best thing we know of for getting really, really high speeds to exit the solar system. And you would do all that acceleration really inside the Earth's orbit. Uh, you would do it really, really close to the sun. And then as you're moving out and the sunlight pressure starts dropping off, eventually you're just coasting, but you've achieved a really, really high speed. Oh, it's a, it's a fascinating idea. So let's talk more about the, about the mission. You're going to be maneuvering to an asteroid. So what is the target? 
Well, the target is an asteroid discovered in the year 2020, and it has a real exciting name. It's called 2020 GE, <laughs> uh, 2020 for the year it's discovered. And our, uh, uh, I'm, I'm actually one of two PIs for this flight. I'm in charge of the propulsion system for the technology. Um, my co-investigator, Dr. Julie Castillo-Roger from JPL, she's the asteroid scientist. So our job is to get her there, uh, and we have, a, not her, her camera, um, and we have on board the spacecraft uh, a camera that's going to do some up-close and personal imaging of the asteroid as we fly by and do science. What is it made out mm -hmm. of? Is it, a, is it a solid rock? Is it a cloud of debris? bunch of rocks put together and 2020 GE is one of the smallest asteroids we will have ever visited if not the smallest so we're really getting insight into uh you know just basically what's in the neighborhood and what do they look like oh man it's going to be amazing um and if this works like how does sending a CubeSat with its own solar sail to asteroids, how does that maybe change the paradigm of how we explore asteroids? Because I think, you know, if you talk to asteroid researchers and said, we could probably figure out a way to give you images of, of hundreds of asteroids, thousands of asteroids. Is that interesting to you? <laughs> well, it was the reason we were selected for funding. Yeah. Because right now, when you send a spacecraft to an asteroid just to see what's there, you typically do more than that. You're, you're, you're doing a lot of in-depth science. You bring spectrometers, you bring other instruments, and those missions are much more expensive than what the NEA Scout costs, which is a small spacecraft is, you know, much less expensive overall. Um, and when we were initially funded, the idea was that we might eventually be sending people to asteroids. And before you send people, you want to do some kind of reconnaissance, right? Before we sent people to the moon, we sent lunar flyby probes and landers uh, to see what was there. And before we go to Mars, we're going to be mapping Mars with our robots. And so if we're ever going to send people to asteroids, you're going to want a way to uh, find and do some reconnaissance. And small solar sail propelled spacecraft would be good for that. And then there are a lot of startup companies that are talking about using asteroid resources for commercial space stations to resupply missions to the moon and otherwise. And it might be a good way for them to do some kind of, you know, survey or assay of what's out there and what the resources are. I mean, th that idea of a scout, like I think a lot of the targets that have been we've sent play, spacecraft to here in the solar system, we've kind of known what they are. Like it's worth it sending a giant flagship mission to Saturn. It's worth it sending a spacecraft to Pluto because we've never looked at a Kuiper Belt object up close. But there are millions of of unseen asteroids and trojans. All we see is a dot, and some of them could be really fascinating scientifically and give us divulge secrets about the formation of the solar system. And some of them might have come from other star systems. And, and we need a way to survey hundreds of them, thousands of them to find the really interesting ones to then send follow on flagship missions with all those instruments that you that you mentioned. So it sounds like a great way to survey could could once the Neo Scout has has seen its one target, could it then move to another target? Yes, it can. And right now we're not funded to do that. We're funded to do the science at uh, 2020 GE. But if the spacecraft is still working, you better believe we're going to be looking at what other asteroids can be easily reached. Because if the system is still working, why turn it off, right? Why not go visit something else and have a, have a low cost flight time of six months to a year to go survey another asteroid, right? And, and it could go forever i mean i mean obviously well, there, there are limits no, right yeah. you know you're out in space and space is is the worst but but you know with new horizons with curiosity they have an rtg on board and that and they're going to run out of energy if eventually like the voyagers are are running out but in your case there's no propellant the electricity yeah. is coming from the sun the propellant but is coming from the give, sun uh, you'll last I got, forever I have to give a little I have to give you a little caveat there. Those missions are much more expensive missions that have a lot more redundant systems. Sure. Uh, they have radiation, more radiation tolerant electronics. We're operating in an environment where the radiation from the sun is pretty high. And when we look at what's likely to fail on the spacecraft, uh, there are lots of things that could break and there's no backup system. I mean, it's a small spacecraft, so everything's single string. But we anticipate when the mission does die sometime after two years, probably before five years, it'll be because the electronics get fried uh, from cumulative radiation damage because we just couldn't afford the most radiation tolerant 
electronics. And the volume we had to work with in the spacecraft was such that we couldn't put in a lot of shielding. So we had to compromise all of those things with cost and schedule to get what we have. So in theory, you're correct. But when you get down to the details, uh, if any critical sus subsystem fails, the whole mission's over because there really are not many backups on board. But I, uh, but I liken this like, like I'm sure you've been watching what's happening with the Mars Ingenuity helicopter flying with Perseverance. You've got this mobile scout that you can deploy that is a fraction of the weight of the main rover, and yet it is out there exploring interesting targets. That that is. I think a absolute game changer, total new paradigm for how to explore a, a planet. And I think with what you're doing with Neoscout, it's kind of the same thing that that you've got these small, relatively inexpensive, quick to deploy spacecraft. And the more out there that you can put, the more of the solar system we can explore and discover. And then anything that's interesting, you send a follow on. I mean, you say it's only going to last a couple of years. Come on. We know we <laughs> spirit opportunity. We know how this works. These things last forever. Scientists find fixes. They just keep going and going and going until well, it takes like so. a, I mean, dust we've storms got a in space. So. We have a fantastic team, uh, both at NASA Marshall and at JPL, who've been working on this, and it's a real can-do team. So we're going to bring all of the mission life we can out of this spacecraft. I just don't want to build expectations that we're going to last a long time when, in fact, you know, we may not, right? It's just us. No one's, um, no one's going to listen to this. Don't worry about it. Um, <laughs> but so, so then what are the, you know, like, assuming this mission works, what are the implications of because it's really weird to me that solar sails have not been embraced as much as they could be. I mean, we've seen the the Planetary Society has launched a solar sail. The Japanese launched a solar sail. We know this technology works. Why have they, I guess, what is the future hold? And I don't want to talk about why it hasn't been adopted, but like, what is the future hold for solar sails? What role do you see them playing in the future of solar system exploration? Well, I do want to talk a little bit about what's happened before and where we are and what's different now. Uh, NASA flew a small sail in orbit in 2010 called NanoSail D. That was the same year the Japanese deployed their Icarus uh, in interplanetary space. And then in the mid-teens, the Planetary Society actually flew two sails in Earth orbit. Uh, there have been a few others out there, but most of those, almost all of them, have been just deployment demonstrations. And that's important. That's the first step. NEA Scout is the first mission to go operational, mm -hmm. which means we have to deploy the sail and we have to steer and navigate. And no one has ever done that before. Yeah. And that's the tricky part that we have to prove out that we can actually do that with NEA Scout. Uh, in fact, one of our objectives is to say we move from point A we want to go to point B and actually get to point B <laughs> yeah. uh, to details. show that we're, we're the details, details that we're yeah. actually able to tip and tilt the sail and navigate yeah. and go where we say we're going to go. And, and rightly so, mission planners probably don't want to plan a science mission or something that has a must get their payload that's pretty ex expensive until they've seen all aspects of a solar sail propulsion system work. And NEA Scout will be really the first one over its two-year mission to demonstrate the full operational capability of sales. And once that's proven, I expect to see others using them. Now, immediately enabled will be sales uh, up to a few times larger than NEA Scout because the technology is pretty scalable. So I, I envision that we could see um, spacecraft two to three times the size of, of us carrying science instruments just about anywhere in the inner solar system after we fly. But we're also working on the technology, and we've got a technology project right now uh, to develop a sail that's up to 18,000 square feet. Now we're talking. Now we're talking. Yeah. And here at NASA Marshall, it, we've actually got a deployment test. The team started yesterday uh, putting together a quadrant, one-fourth of that size sail. Uh, that's going to be deployed uh, here at NASA Marshall. We'll have pictures of that in early November. And uh, we'll be inviting uh, some of some VIPs down and others to uh, take a look at what the sail looks like. And this is a test of the deployment system for a sail that large. Oh. And we're working to get funding for a flight of a full sail of that size sometime in the mid to late 20s. And I mean, there are plenty of applications. You think about station keeping, um, shift, you know, if you're patient, if, you, if, if you're not in a rush, it feels like 
the perfect way to get from from place to place because you're not requiring propellant and and at the end of the day getting that propellant into space is one of the most expensive parts of this whole process if you don't have to you don't have to, to carry it so do you envision a time when there is a solar sail attached to almost every spacecraft up to some small scales? spacecraft <laughs> well but even like i mean you say small but i mean i think about the kepler mission which was able to continue doing science by using light pressure from the sun to orient the telescope that ever present photon out there you know can oh yeah can i don't want to underplay that yeah yeah, yeah absolutely um you know in the immediately in the future, there's a lot of interest for putting sails in places that do more tangible things uh, to, to everyday life, like uh, early warning of solar storms. I know you've done uh, programs about you know space weather and solar storms here, and a sail-enabled spacecraft that could be flown right after this this 18,000 square foot sail system is flown, put closer to the sun than the Earth Sun Lagrange point, which is the region where the gravity roughly balances between the Earth and the sun, and that's where we have spacecraft now. Because once they're placed there, as the Earth goes around the sun, they're always between us and the sun. And when the radiation from a solar storm gets there, they send out a radio alert, which travels faster than that radiation that says, hey, there's a storm coming, satellite operators batten down the hatches. Well, a sail with its constant thrust would let you get closer to the sun, always stay on that Earth-Sun line. And when the storm reaches the sail, you would send your radio signal, which would be quicker uh, then waiting on it to get closer to the earth and you can increase the warning time uh, almost double wow. the warning time. That's amazing. Uh, with those with those future sales. Now any A Scout won't demonstrate that, but the right. follow-on mission would. So there's a lot of practical use in there. And then also you're right. Uh for for any when I say small, I really mean something that doesn't have humans on board. Uh you, you get a whole new order of magnitude in, in mass and size with humans. But spacecraft that are hundreds of pounds or more could have conceivably have sails that'll be enabled by this next generation sail system, which could supplement their propulsion. It can allow them to con continually maneuver, change locations, and even go to destinations that you run out of gas uh trying yeah. to stay in uh using conventional propulsion. So there's a whole host of of applications. All right. So now you know, to the people at NASA who might be listening to this, we're going to now shift into speculation mode. This is driven by me. This is not coming from Les. Les <laughs> understands the absolute separation between his work as a NASA propulsion engineer and a science fiction writer. So let's envision the future then. What role do you think a, a well-adopted solar sail engineering platform looks like across the solar system 50 years from now 100 years from now if we really lean into this technology what would the solar system look like well you're getting into what really motivates me now mm -hmm. uh, I, I love asteroid science and advancing science but what i really want to do is make sure that those folks that follow me in the aerospace field the younger folks that are there today pick up the ball and take it to this next generation systems that's one of the reasons I write science fiction is I want to get people fired up. Um, I, I, in addition to having spacecraft all over the solar system uh, with sails, and I mentioned earlier the interstellar voyage because that's really a passion of mine is, is going to the stars. There are other things much closer to home that will benefit people here on Earth. Uh, it, listeners, uh, viewers may be familiar with the idea of space-based solar power. Uh, one of the things we're investigating with solar sails is if you can take this thin film membrane and embed photovoltaics for power generation. These, uh, if you go to homes now or you're outside and, and you're camping and you put out a solar generator, uh, your, your solar array is typically a mat that's rolled up, mm -hmm. right? And you roll it out because the thin film solar cells are flexible. Well, we have a demonstration that's going to fly in Earth orbit next year called the Lightweight Integrated Solar Array, LISA. And it is basically taking these thin film photovoltaics like you have when you go camping, putting it on a solar sail substrate, which gives it a very large area with a lot of cells to generate a lot of power. And so I can see where we might take something the size of NEA Scout, and instead of using the sail for propulsion, we cover it in thin film solar array. OK, and we use that to uh, replace nuclear power sources, perhaps for some outer solar system missions. Uh, the sunlight gets dim, but you've got this huge collection area where you can still get enough power 
to, to, to power some probes out there. Uh, now, when you get farther out, you might have to take that 18,000 square foot sail and cover it with solar cells to get power for it, but it's possible, right? Um, you might also use those somewhere outside of Earth orbit where there's no atmospheric drag as space solar power stations where you're collecting lots of electrical power and beaming it back down to the Earth. Perhaps not. Maybe you're beaming it to a commercial space station. Maybe you're beaming it to a, uh, a base right. on the moon. Yeah, in the right? shadowed craters of the moon that needs power. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I wrote a paper a few years ago looking at how you could put a solar power station in lunar orbit. And every time you pass over, you beam down power to charge the batteries for a base that otherwise is in the dark. So you could do that. And I, I'm also extremely concerned about uh, climate change and global warming. And uh, it, it's a whole other topic that we don't want to get into. And NASA definitely is not paying me to think about this. This is just me kind of dreaming. Um, you know, we're going to have to do something as a bridge while we become carbon zero or carbon negative, because I don't think we're going to be able to stop the temperature rise quickly enough. And if you were to put some of these big sails, a lot of them, think hundreds of thousands of them, potentially square kilometer in area at that L1 point, you could actually uh, decrease the amount of heat energy a little bit coming into the Earth's atmosphere and bias time as we become carbon negative. So there are lots of really cool things you can do with sales that people are thinking about. And I mean, you know, people ask me like, when are we going to mine the asteroids and when are we going to have humans flitting about the solar system? And, and my perspective is that it's very much about infrastructure, that these solar sails that you mentioned, these these way stations along the way we'll know we're on it's happening when the infrastructure is being built the analogy is when we see the highways when we see the bridges being built the road systems that enables that that next generation what kind of infrastructure could we place across the solar system that would that would enable that next step in our exploration and you know living becoming a true solar system spanning civilization well, there are lots of things I think we ought to be doing. I, I think these commercial ventures for tourism or space stations ought to have in their business model that they're going to pay a certain amount of money for water and power. And instead of designing that into their system, just have incentives for companies mm. to provide it to them, right? And so you might have uh, asteroid prospectors like an NEA scout find something that's got a lot of water ice, and then a company comes out and figures out how to move it so that they can get that ice to uh, a lunar base, right? So that they don't have to bring water up from the Earth all the way to the moon. Or if there is water ice on the moon, they could, they could get it there. Um, I think these big thin film photovoltaics could be power stations where you beam power to various uh, places that need it throughout the inner solar system. You could also take uh, these big deployable structures and turn them into antennas. Uh, and that way you can get, for instance, high definition television from Mars, Saturn, or further out, rather than having to use something like the deep space network with these big ground based dishes just to get a few bits to put together into a nice picture, which takes years from things like uh, New Horizons. Right. Yeah. Uh, maybe you could have high bandwidth communication across the solar system with these things. So there's a lot of in infrastructure that we need to put into place. For, for me, I, I think the, the game changer in my career and my adult lifetime has been the rise of commercial space and potentially tourism. And, and that really benefits everybody. It drives down the cost of launch and it enables people to start thinking about infrastructure. So when we talk about space uh, exploration, it's not just exploration, it's exploration and development, which is, I think, the next step we've got to do. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it, I mean, I, I feel like, like people always want to know, as I said, like, when are we going to mine Mars? When are we going to, when are we going to have humans set on Mars? And, and it's less about like, it, right now, it's incredibly difficult. The risks are overwhelming. It is the equivalent of you in the 1800s attempting to cross Antarctica alone. Um, but <laughs> but but now you, probably possible, but it may not be a good yeah, idea. Yeah, but right? now you can fly to Antarctica. <laughs> you can go to yeah. the Concordia base. They will serve you an espresso and some fresh vegetables they grew in their greenhouse there. That that there are diesel generators that are operating. That there are airplanes coming and going. There are tractors. Like all that infrastructure is there. There's flush toilets. Like everything is there to support your existence. And we kind of can't have one without the other. Um, and it's the building of the infrastructure that is boring, and yet it will enable the, the next step. So, but let's talk about the stars. You are fascinated by humanity's travel beyond Earth. 
why? <laughs> well, the easiest way to answer that question is, is to go outside, away from a city and away from these uh, blasted, really bright LED streetlights and, and look up at the night sky. And uh, I, I am a firm believer that if we had a controlled blackout so nobody got hurt uh, and everybody went outside and looked up at the sky, two things would happen. One is a lot more people would go to church, right? Because they're going to be wondering, who am I in this great unknown, right? And the other thing is they're going to say, we have got to do more exploration. There's a lot out there to find. We need to go, yeah. right? And, and for me, um, it, it's, it's one of scientific curiosity. Uh, what's out there? We, we know about a lot about the earth and science has always been about uncovering the next layer of what's in nature. And the best thing, way to do that is to go explore it. But I think there's something more fundamental for me. It's a compulsion. And it's a compulsion that's really hard for me to explain other than to tell people to uh, go out on a cool, clear night, look at the sky, and and just allow yourself to get lost in that. And it's almost like a, a feeling of falling for me. Um, and and once I do that, it's, it's a calling. I'm being called. Uh, and I know that sounds kind of mystical or spiritual. Uh, physics allows me to better understand it. Working with people who share that belief and passion gives me camaraderie and excitement that we're making something happen, we're doing something. But at the end of the day, it's because there's this big universe out there. Life uh, is on Earth. It's us. Yeah. If it exists anywhere else, it's rare. Uh, we know that because we haven't seen any signs of it as we look out. And I almost feel it as a moral obligation to protect and preserve life, which is good and go and explore and spread life all over the universe. So it's, I think it's, it's the ultimate um, goal of the human race, in my opinion, is to, is to better our lives on earth, protect the planet and then spread life beyond earth. Yeah. I always sort of describe it that, that life is better than a rock. That, oh yeah. That the rocks are fine, but life is interesting. Life is fascinating and the universe is made better by life. And what if, we are the only place in the entire universe that life formed. Wouldn't it be a shame? We had our chance. We climate changed our way to extinction and, or we let the artificial intelligence take over or we didn't stop the asteroid or we had a nuclear, whatever. Right. And, and then there was no more life in the universe and it, yeah. was, it was on our watch. We could have been the ones that, that spread it out there and we didn't. I, I think that would be uh, not only a tragedy for those that died, <laughs> right. um, but on a great scheme, that would be a moral yeah. tragedy. That, yeah. would, that would be terrible. I, I'm with you. I'm absolutely with you. But we've got to be careful that we do it in the context of hopefully improving the quality of life on Earth for everybody as we do it. It's not a way to escape. Uh, I don't want people to think that people are developing space or we have an interest because we want to escape Earth. I love this planet. People people have asked me less, if you had an opportunity to go to Mars, would you go? And my answer to that question is, as long as I can come back and it's in tourist class. Right. Because <laughs> yeah. I want to get back to my deck with trees around me and my family and kids and uh, maybe yeah. grandkids someday and and all that. And 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 I have no interest in going to you know Mars and dying on Mars. So I, I'm all about coming back to a beautiful place on Earth. Yeah, Earth is the best place in the universe. Absolutely. For us. And yep. and. Anywhere that we go across the universe, it would be not quite as good as the Earth, purely because we evolved to live on this planet. Now, now take the long view, though, because, I mean, if, one, if we do go to the stars and we undertake voyages to not just go, but to stay, with the rapid discovery of uh, exoplanets, some of which might be in the habitable zone where you could have liquid water, chances are none are exactly like Earth or immediately habitable. But some of them might be, you know, terraformable if mm -hmm. there's not already life existing there where you could make it more conducive to Earth life and, and eventual settlement. But you have to have the long view of thousands of years as opposed to the typical, you know, six month quarterly report that you probably read for your retirement. Yeah, you could fund. make a mediocre um, version of Earth somewhere else yes. for, for our per, from our perspective. And and I think that's important. Like you're not going to find these beautiful garden worlds that are more habitable for us than earth itself just because we are we evolved in this exact environment now let's talk about practically speaking what methods of interstellar 
exploration are intriguing to you at this point? Well, when you when you look at going to the stars, uh, there are a lot of ways we could send probes to the stars. For instance, the Voyager probe is on its way out of the right. solar system. And if it were pointed in the right direction, which it's not, it could reach the nearest stars, Alpha, Proxima, Centauri, in about 70,000 years. Done. Problem solved. Yep. Yeah, right. Well, I don't, <laughs> that's too long a time frame. So I, I try to bring that time frame into two. One is a thousand year voyage. And the reason I picked a thousand years is because that's kind of the realm of history and understanding that we have. We have recorded history going back a thousand years. So if we launch a probe to the stars, chances are, unless we destroy ourselves, some descendant out there will be able to listen for the data when it comes back by radio or whatever in a thousand years. And then there's the rapid transit where it might take, you know, a hundred years where it's conceivable that we could send people and a human lifetime kind of voyage across these distances. Um, so I put it into those two categories. Now, obviously the thousand year arc, I think think more of, of, of robotic probes. Uh, so the solar sail is absolutely a possibility. A cousin of a solar sail is a laser-driven light sail. And that's the subject for the people who are working on the Breakthrough Starshot, which is a privately funded initiative to develop uh, an interstellar propulsion system for a probe. And basically, that's just taking the intensity of sunlight and augmenting it by shining super powerful laser light on the sail to more rapidly accelerate right. So you could conceivably have a much smaller sail than square kilometers, which you'd have to have with solar sails, uh, to maybe a few meters with powerful enough lasers that you could send a probe to another star. Uh, do we know how to do that today? No. Physics says, yeah, you might be able to figure this out, get to work. Right. right. So we've got engineers, not at NASA really, but looking all over at that. Then you get to nuclear power. And one of the things that is so disappointing is the power that we used in nuclear uh, generators to generate our electrical power today doesn't have the energy density, really, to accelerate mm. a spacecraft to high enough speeds to have that short duration trip. So even uh, nuclear fission is, isn't going to do it. Right. We need the next step, which is nuclear fusion. And uh, there's been a lot of encouraging news in the press the last few years about different groups that have improved the efficiency of fusion, uh, which is how the sun produces energy, right? In the core of our star, hydrogen is squeezed together to make helium, and that releases energy. Well, there are other ways to squeeze it with lasers and all these other methods that people are developing. So we need to make sure we can, you know, do fusion, generate power, and then miniaturize it, which will be another challenge to right. put it on a spacecraft as opposed to using a big building or a super collider yeah. to do it. And make it last but again, for 100, 100 years. But, yeah, it, it could. It really could. Yeah. Uh, that would be good for the nearest stars, uh, but not so good for things that are 10 light years to 100 light years out. You don't have the energy density for that, even with nuclear fusion. So that gets us to the ultimate battery, which is the matter-antimatter annihilation. Now we're talking. And now we're talking. Now we have the energy density that Einstein equals mc squared, where you, where you take the matter of a proton and this real particle called an antiproton, which weighs like much as a proton, looks like a proton, but instead of a positive charge, it's got a negative charge and a slightly different nuclear spin state. And when they encounter each other, they basically annihilate all that matter and turn it into gamma rays, mesons, muons, and all kinds of energy is released. And if you could capture that energy, which is the challenge, then you have an, a power source that can take you on a starship with a hundred year voyage to the nearest star and maybe to 10 light years or so wow. in, in reasonable trip times. But we don't know how to make and store that much antimatter. Um, the, the, it's the amount that's produced every year artificially in particle accelerators like we have at CERN, uh, is almost immediately annihilated in short term reactions. And we haven't ever really stored it for long periods of time, nor do we know how to affordably make it. But that's an engineering and cost challenge. Yes. Not a fundamental physics challenge. Right. Like, right? like if you go back to the actual just base physics of this for every uh, mega newton of energy or sorry, every kilowatt of energy that you put into this, you should theoretically be able to store some significant fraction of a kilowatt of of antimatter future energy. It's a battery, as you say. It, it, is a, it is the best battery. And so you talk about infrastructure. You know, in my view, my view of the future is we put big solar power stations, you know, big powered by solar sails covered with photovoltaics that are 100 square kilometers across, right? Generating the power for a particle accelerator that is creating antimatter. 
And that antimatter is being stored in magnetic bottles in vacuum. You've already got the vacuum of space. So you set up these magnets where charged particles can't escape the magnetic field that they're trapped in. And you build up grams, kilograms, maybe a metric ton of antimatter well away from the earth. Right. Okay. It'd be a really bad day to have that on the earth. And that is then in a magnetic bottle put in your starship and you start releasing a little bit of it at a time to get the reaction energy you need to go to Alpha Centauri and you're on your way. So that's kind of the, the solar system infrastructure that I dream of. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, it's each one of those steps that you mentioned is incredibly difficult. But none of these violate the laws of physics as we understand them. That's correct. We don't need to have the unobtainable drive that yeah. gives us, that violates Newton's laws of action and reaction. Uh, we don't have to have uh, negative energy, whatever the heck that is. Right. Um, you know, we don't have to uh, say, oh, well, all you have to do is create a mini black hole, you know, and do this or that. Well, that's great. <laughs> don't really see a path from here to there. Um but it's stuff that we can envision building. We just haven't done the engineering development to do it yet. And then, as you said, the other really viable path is the laser-powered solar sail. Right. So if I were to, to, to have a, a program, which I actually did a few years ago, looking at what it might take us to the stars, um, I, I would have a, a vigorous solar sail, laser sail activity. And I would uh, be w monitoring what's happening commercially with fusion. I think the industry is going to lead that as opposed to for interstellar travel, at least for a while. And once that becomes a, a commercially viable, then you might start investing for space applications to miniaturize it, to take it to space. And, and I'd be working real hard on trying to figure out how to more affordably generate and store antimatter. Because yeah. I think those would be the propulsion systems that we need. And then you have all the other stuff. It's not just propulsion. Right. You have to be able to keep the crew alive or the spacecraft alive while it's in space uh, where there's no energy off board. So even with a solar sail or a laser sail, you have to have a way to get power while you're on the voyage. Um, and after you get there, if you're going to stop, you have to slow down. And that's a problem with sail solar and laser sails is they're, right. they're difficult to figure out ways to stop. Whereas things like fusion and antimatter are like a conventional rocket. You just turn around and start thrusting the other way uh, to slow down. So there are a lot of challenges getting from here to there. And and eh, they're, they're, none of them seem to be insurmountable. Yeah, yeah. Um, one of the ideas that's that was really quite inspired, but maybe isn't quite panning out, is this idea of collecting your hydrogen fuel as you go on your mission. This, you know, the Bustard Ramjet proposed like back in the 60s, like all good ideas, um, or 70s. Anyway, uh, do you think that's going to be feasible? Or is it just not going to work? Well, I won't say it won't work. I think there are a lot of challenges. It's really, as I understand it, and there are dueling academic papers <laughs> on this topic. Um, if you can find a way to collect the interstellar hydrogen, so that your collision with it and the drag force you experience. You know, if you're driving down the road and you roll down the window and you put your hand out and then up like this, it's going to fly back from the, the drag force on the area of your hand. Well, to collect this interstellar hydrogen, you probably need a big collector because interstellar space has like one hydrogen atom per cubic meter, <laughs> really not much. So if you're going to collect enough hydrogen, you have to have a big collector. Well, if it's a physical collector, as that hydrogen hits it, it's going to be slowing you down in a drag force, right? Then you always have uh, the second law of thermodynamics to contend with, which means there's no process that's 100% efficient. So once you collect it, you then have to get it to your your power, your propulsion system, accelerate it, whatever you're going to do to get the power out of it, which is also not 100% uh, efficient. So when you look at all those steps and how much push you get this way from collecting it versus all the drag you had pushing this way, this one has to be greater. And, and right now, there's a big debate as to whether it physically actually can be. And uh, to answer that problem, if you get away from a physical sail and you go to something like a magnetic sail, uh, to, to, or sail, a magnetic scoop is probably a better word, uh, to scoop up the hydrogen, then maybe you get rid of some of that drag force and you can have a net thrust right. out of it by the time you're finished. So there's, like I say, there are dueling academic papers. I, I think the verdict is still out yeah. on the bizarre or, or, or maybe you are spending time that you're collecting fuel with your sails out and you're and you're experiencing that drag and then you're bringing the sails in and then you're processing then you're firing the drive Possibly. and then right, right. So some some combination is there anything else out there that you think is even 
potentially a way to get to another star or the or those sort of like your like what about a photonic drive oh you could do yeah photon drives in fact uh in in my novel with travis taylor uh saving proxima you gave me an end to talk about my writing nice see? uh <laughs> um we published that last summer and we talk about a trip to uh proxima centauri on a spacecraft powered by a photon drive and a photon drive uh for those that might not be familiar with it i mentioned a solar sail reflects sunlight to get a push well a laser when it shines a laser light out, the physical laser is actually getting a recoil force because you're sending light this way, so the, the laser is going to recoil. So in theory, if you built an intense enough laser and put it on a spacecraft and were emitting that much light, that reaction force could accelerate your spacecraft and take it to very high speeds. So the answer to your question is yes, you could do that, but the energy densities just get really, really, right. really high because each photon doesn't give you that much momentum for transfer. And and I have to be careful here because I don't want to throw out uh, for arbitrary reasons, a propulsion system that might work just because I personally perceive it as really hard. There might be people out there who've looked at the photon drive compared it to antimatter and say, less, it's a lot easier than antimatter. Well, mm -hmm. they're both on that, you know, orders of magnitude more difficult than what we can do today. So the verdict is out. I'm, right. gl I'm glad you mentioned that. Yeah. I mean, I'm, uh, I'm, you know, I'm envisioning drive is a possibility. Yeah, yeah. I mean, like I'm envisioning like a, I don't know, like one of those, like, you know, those dragging kites that have this big, long tail behind them. And that would be your solar sail, which would be streamlined. It would be hanging back behind the spacecraft. And then you've got a laser that's accelerating you, but then the, the your solar panels that could be say tens of thousands of kilometers long are gathering starlight from the universe, right? Or harvesting some amount of radiation that's, that you're then turning into electricity and then you're using that to fire the laser. And it's, you're not getting much thrust, but over hundreds of years, thousands of years of constant acceleration, who knows what you could you could pull off. So- Well, and there, and there are other ways too. I, I, in my earlier career, I was using uh, the interaction of something called an electrodynamic tether with the Earth's magnetic field to generate power and propulsion in much the same way that the alternator of your car uh, or a power plant generates electricity, which is basically a, a magnet moving with some wires around it, which generates electricity. And that's how we, we generate electricity. Well, the, there's an interstellar magnetic field. And so in theory, you could also have uh, multi-hundred kilometer thin wires uh, conductors made out of graphene, my, my favorite material, or something like that, where you're actually generating power as you move through the interstellar magnetic field to help drive your spacecraft. And again, you'd have to do the power balance. Is that more drag net than it is thrust? But that that's also been a method for decelerating that's right, that's what I've sails heard. Yeah. as you go into a near a star, because a star has one heck of a magnetic field and a plasma sphere. So it's conceivable that these these solar sails, as they come screaming in at 10 or 20 percent the speed of light to another star system, unfurl a thousand kilometer cable uh, to interact with the stellar magnetic field and do a few loop arounds the star. And each time they come in, they're slowing down more and more until finally they're captured into orbit around the star. It's fun. To, it's fun to think about. Yeah. Yeah. There was a there was a project called the Dragonfly Project. I'm sure you saw the the paper and they proposed that that you that you accelerate it with a laser sail and then you you ditch the solar sail and then deploy the mag sail. And the mag sail slows you down through the interstellar medium over the course of a hundred years to the point that you can actually go into orbit around your target destination. And some combination of those will will do the trick. So, I mean, you talk about science fiction inspiring you and others to get into this. Do you think that science fiction does a disservice in in sugarcoating the realities of what it takes? Because my impression when I interact with people on my YouTube channel and stuff is is they roll their eyes at how hard this stuff is ending up being and they're like, well, why don't you just, you know, lull, just use anti gravity or a warp drive like we know the UFOs have it. Um, <laughs> do, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. Like, do you think that that it brings people in because it's inspiring, but like Star Trek is not a rigorous exploration of space flight it is boats in three dimensions it's it's a naval show um that has that has the science fiction trappings do you think that that there's a way an off-ramp again to bring people back to reality should we 
Wow. Should we? Um, I, I think it's a mix. I think people need to be entertained and inspired. And, and sometimes you have to put the part of your brain, uh, which is the reality check, just on hold. Right. right? Um, and I have to do that a lot. Uh, but I found that I have a friend who's a police officer. And whenever he watches a police procedural on TV, he has to do the same thing. Yep. <laughs> um, so I think it's, uh, you know, when, when you're an expert in a field and you see how it's portrayed, you see all the warts that they go through uh, to make it entertaining. So I'm not going to be too critical of a lot of these shows because I think you really have to do what you have to do to make them entertaining, right? Um, but at the same time, um, let me just make sure my phone is bugging the crap out of me. It's ringing here. I, I thought I had it off. I apologize. Um, at the same time, you got to be careful you don't lose the entertainment factor. And I think they do a fine line on that. Now, the other problem is some shows are very, very, very intentional about making it realistic. And and that, I think, can draw in a lot of people also because it gives them a yeah. sense of how really hard it'll be. I think the disservice that we get is people are wondering why we haven't done more already. That's that's what I'm to, saying. To, to what we're trying to do, right? Yeah. And, uh, I, I, and I, the answer to that is I think during the Apollo era, people thought it was going to be a lot easier to do, and it isn't. And I think there's been a set expectation in the process. And that's hard to get over. I think a lot of people are frustrated at the lack of progress. Uh, they, they think that for some reason we aren't trying hard enough or, or whatever. Uh, and it really is just because it's hard. Yeah. And it's a lot harder than, than science fiction portrays it to be. Right. Yeah. And, and science fiction makes it feel like it's easy. And it's not easy. It does. It's hard. And it's dangerous. It and is hard. it is always a, a – you know, a, a giant risk for the people involved and the, and the hardware and so on. And, and I, I, yeah, I feel sometimes like a counselor almost sometimes <laughs> where, you know, where a person comes to the channel, my channel, and they're like, I want to talk about, about stargates and warp drives and, and all that kind of stuff. And I'm like, yeah, no, we all got excited about this field because of that. But I have to be the bearer of bad news and tell you that all this stuff that really got you inspired about science fiction isn't going to happen anytime soon. But, 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 and then let me tell you about all this amazing stuff that is happening. These wonderful discoveries and these incredible techniques that are pushing the limits of what we know. And, and the actual realities of a solar sail for me today are vastly more exciting than seeing them go to go to light speed in a Star Wars movie. Well, I think what's exciting because you you have that distant perspective also is that these are the first steps. Yeah. And and you know, we 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 tend to maybe get enmeshed in the moment we don't appreciate the significance historically of what we're doing. And and perhaps in 200 years they'll look back at some of the steps we've made now with the same awe that we look at when we think about those people uh, who settled the Polynesian islands and those little boats, you know, paddling across the Pacific, right? Oh my gosh, those people were brave. How many of them died along the way, uh, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, it, with, with the perspective of history, you realize that was a significant achievement and it was an essential step forward, right? So I, I think that perspective is, is often lost on people. And I encounter that. I, it, what's funny, Frazier is uh, at Dragon Con, going back to science fiction, and I go to smaller conventions uh, also. When I go to those, people are talking about all of these fantastic science fictional space drives and all the stuff we could be doing, and I'm right with them. I dream about it. And then I tell them the reality, and they look at me and they're like, "Oh, you're just being corporate. You know, yeah. you, you're just, you know, you're, you're you're too much of a luddite. You're not dreaming enough." And then I go to NASA, where I'm talking about moving spacecraft around with. You know, uh, sails thinner than, for those of you that have hair, <laughs> thinner than your hair, a square kilometer across or 925 square feet across or, a, or an electrodynamic tether getting power and propulsion from the Earth's magnetic field. They look at me like I'm speaking science fiction. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I walk this line where in one world I'm kind of on the edge and in the other world I, I'm, I'm a bureaucratic, you know, Luddite. So uh, I Can't have to win. kind of bounce back and forth with that. And actually I've, I've kind of enjoyed it. I, 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 I totally get why you would enjoy it because it's like you, you have maintained that spirit that has gotten you enthusiastic about it in the first place. You have, gotten as close to the true details as you can and you are a pioneer you're right there helping to push 
humanity into these these next steps in a way that is practical and we hope will reverberate through history when when a thousand years from now our robot overlords look back and wonder how they got there. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> now, now. Well, yeah. <laughs> it's interesting you say that, though, and this sounds a little bit arrogant on my part, but I, I have to attend periodically these management things where you think about your life's vision and what you want to do with your career and all these kind of things, and you have to write out all these things. And, and we were asked, uh, what do you want to be the legacy of what you do in your professional life? And my answer to that was when the historians on a planet circling another star are writing the history of how they got there, that the work that I do is a footnote yep. in that book. Yeah. That's, you that's my career goal. I want to be a footnote. <laughs> yeah, I think that's I think that's a that's a wonderful ambition. Now, Les, you have two areas of your life to promote. So from the science side, if people want to keep track of the work that you're doing and watch the mission, what's the best place to do that? Uh, just uh, go on the internet, and uh, NASA has a website for the Near Earth Asteroid Scout, NEA Scout. Uh, there'll be various media coverage of that and press updates that'll probably from the NASA feeds on, on Twitter or Facebook, there'll be a hashtag for NEA Scout. So you'll be able to search for that and get the latest on what's going on with the mission uh, for, for that. For my science fiction uh, hat that I wear, which yep. I, have to, again, have to keep separate from NASA, this is a big year for me. Uh, October 11th, I have the release of a book, a nonfiction book about interstellar travel that we've been talking about, yep. A Traveler's Guide to the Stars. It's being published by Princeton University Press, which is my first book with, with Princeton. And you can find out about all my, my books on my website, lesjohnsonauthor.com, L-E-S, johnsonauthor.com. I also like hearing getting emails from folks, and you can reach me. It's real easy. Les.Johnson at rocketship.com. Where else? Um, and I've also got a couple of science fiction books that came out over the past year. When I mentioned Saving Proxima and this November, uh, my first foray into what's called space opera, you know, grand sweeping uh, science fiction military story is coming out in paperback and it's called The Space Time War. And that'll be out from Bayon Books. Fantastic. Well, Les, it's been a pleasure to catch up with you. I hope in the future we can be in person again, uh, sitting on a panel at Dragon Con and, and talking about space and astronomy. But but until then, this will, will tide us over. I am counting on it. Right on. All right. Take care. We'll awesome. see you. Uh, we'll see you soon. All right. Very good. Be seeing you.